Greetings and welcome to uh, our conversations on COVID and development. Uh, today, I'm uh, really happy and privileged to be able to talk with uh, Mark Lowcock, who is the Undersecretary General uh, in the UN responsible for humanitarian affairs and also the Emergency Relief Coordinator. And he and Antonio Guterres have been uh, leading the UN uh, response to COVID in, in different ways. So we'll have a chance to talk to, to Mark. I should say in the interest of full disclosure that uh, Mark and I have been uh, friends for a long time and uh, were colleagues together when we were both uh, working uh, at the Department for International Development in the UK now many, many years ago. So Mark, great pleasure to have you and uh, welcome to this uh, conversation. Well, thank you very much, Masood, and I'm delighted to see that you're still upholding the standards of the jacket-wearing classes. Uh, my my own sartorial standards, I'm afraid, in my social isolation and and uh, kind of parked in my apartment in New York, which I essentially never leave, have rather plummeted. But I'm glad oh. to see that yours have not. Thank you. I have dropped the tide in in honor of being at home. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, Mark, you know, I thought what we might do is, is start off by having, by talking a little bit about really what is happening in the fragile states, in the most difficult uh, environments in some ways, and, uh, and both in terms of the spread of the uh, virus itself, where, uh, you know, a lot of people are very worried about what would happen if. Uh, you saw spread in some of the refugee communities in particular, uh, where the whole concept of, sort of social distancing uh, much harder to, to envisage. Uh, and uh, also in fragile states where governments uh, on whom we normally rely to provide some of the income support measures during this period are really not often even in control of, of the territory in which people are living. So I wanted to get sort of what you are getting from your own uh, team uh, in different countries and different situations as to how this uh, pandemic is unfolding, and then we can move on to the international response to it. Well, um, I think the first thing to, to say is a very high degree of um, humility um, is in order uh, as we try to describe what's going on, because the truth is no one knows. Uh, nobody has good answers to the most important questions. Um, a lot of what we're doing is applying our best guesses. And I think uh, uh, honesty about that is really important. I think that the blog that Bill Gates put out um, on about Thursday last week was very helpful in that respect, because he was super clear about the things that we just don't know the answer to. And there are some of those that are very important in the places I work, which are basically those places, the fragile states, the conflict affected states with the lowest incomes um, and the most vulnerability. My office, in fact, has uh, constructed this index of vulnerability to COVID and the places with high humanitarian need, um, places like um, the Central African Republic, South Sudan, uh, Yemen, they are right at the top of the COVID vulnerability index. So among the things we don't know are how the virus relates to the specific conditions in low and middle income countries, issues around temperature, humidity, also though the comorbidities. I mean, what's the interaction say with populations yeah. with a high malaria prevalence or HIV prevalence? What's the interaction with people with high levels of malnutrition. We don't know how the different demographics in low income countries will um, affect the way the virus plays out. Obviously, typically the populations are much younger in those places, nor do we know enough about um, how people who recover um, will do, and in particular, what ongoing protection they will have. Now, obviously, we all hope that knowledge on all of those things will grow over the next few months. But in the meantime, we are left with trying to do the best we can within the limits of the available knowledge. That said, there is some modeling on how the 
pandemic will play out in um, the countries we're talking about, those 50 or 60 countries with big humanitarian suffering. Most of the modeling essentially concludes that the peaks of the out of the pandemic in those places are ahead of us, probably something like three to six months ahead of us. There has been some reporting in the last few days um, of faster acceleration in some of those places. So the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, I think, put something out recently saying that within the next week or so, there will be lots of countries in Africa seeing something like a thousand cases a week. And some weeks after that, there'll be lots of those countries seeing 10,000 cases. So we can expect the number of um, uh, confirmed cases to grow. Although, because testing levels are much lower, I think the um, confidence levels on what we're seeing are are much wider, realistically. So the actual cases now might be higher than we than we think, you know, in, in many countries, of course. I think that's very likely. I mean, there's some places where I work, northeastern Syria, for example, where it's it's impossible to know very much mm. because the lab capacity is more or less non-existent. But I think there's a couple of other things we can already see, Masood, which we need to factor into our thinking about response. The first is that the control measures um, that lots of countries have put in place, you know, those travel restrictions and so on, um, are having a significant effect in a number of ways um, and a bigger impact, in fact, than they do in OECD countries. Firstly, because large numbers of people are reliant on daily labor and have very little in the way of reserves. As those people get hungrier, the ability to sustain lockdown yes. will be restricted. Children out of school in these places can't realistically learn remotely. Immunization campaigns, which are the, you know, one of the best investments to saving lives, are being affected. But in addition to that, it's getting harder to get the aid workers to where they need to be and getting their supplies and materials to them as well. But I think even bigger than that set of impacts is the likely impact um, on the economy. I think the disease itself, we don't really know. The effects of the measures we can see a little bit about, but I suspect the biggest impact of all will be the economic. Because a lot of these places are seeing collapses in their commodity earnings, whether they're the oil producers or others, dramatic reductions in remittance flows, more or less complete close down on tourism, and they're also being affected by global reductions in trade and so on. Clearly, the IFIs have told us that the world economy for the first time for a long time will get smaller this year. Um, and we think our modeling suggests that one impact of that will be that really for the first time since 1990, the global poverty rate, the proportion of the global population in extreme poverty below $1.90 a day will grow. There are a wide range of estimates by how much it will grow, some of them quite big, some of them smaller, but I think everyone forecasts now that there will be a higher poverty headcount this year for the uh, than last year for the first time for many, many years. And I would and argue that that's not going to go down next year either. I mean, I think I, you know, the, I, the I shadow of that. these crises tends to last a lot, lot longer than, yeah. than we you know, anticipate. And, and if you look at the last crisis, which was nowhere near the same in the 2008 financial crisis, uh, six, seven years later, countries were still falling short of their trend trajectory. So it takes a long time to catch up, absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, and there, of course, is a very extreme dimension of this problem, which is the number of people within that extreme poverty category who are um, just a step away from starvation. Mm. David Beasley, my colleague who runs the World Food Program, briefed the Security Council a few days ago to say that number could double this year. Coming into 2020, we thought it'd be 130 million people who um, would not survive without large-scale food aid and food assistance. That number we think now could be 250 million. So really, I mean, if you think about it, you know, we, if you look at slightly better off developing countries, <clears throat> emerging markets uh, or low-income countries, uh, 
where poverty is not quite as extreme. They've been doing relatively well. They started off being given advice essentially to follow the same approach in public health and, and in uh, uh, the sort of economic uh, consequences of the uh, testing, isolation, and uh, closing down uh, businesses and, and uh, transport that we had been doing in rich countries. You know. so they, they, and now you see over the course of the last two or three weeks, uh, a body of work emerging which says, look, this is uh, unlikely to be feasible because uh, if just the way people live, the way people work, the, the way they, they earn every day, the, the money they need to buy food for, the, for that evening. Uh, it's not going to be sustainable to, to maintain these kinds of lockdown. And, and in any event, uh, uh, flattening the, the curve, the peak, uh, is unlikely to generate a kind of outcome that would be manageable for the health systems of these countries because the health systems are going to be overwhelmed. So you, you begin to see a sort of uh, a, a little bit of a change in the way people are approaching this and thinking about it. Uh, same thing in terms of uh, schools, you know, should you close the schools, should you leave them open? And then you realize that having a, uh, you know, kids out of school, a uh, billion and a half kids out of school, you know, is itself going to leave many of them vulnerable to everything from school provided nutrition programs to even physical safety and security for, for many of them. And now those issues, I think, are going to be even more present in the countries you're talking about. And the ability of governments to provide uh, action, to act in, in, in response to this pandemic in those environments is also more constrained for the reasons you say. I mean, governments are much weaker. Some places they're they're really not uh, functional at all, and so it relies a lot more on the international system to to come in and provide that support. Now, of course, you, the UN, have been leading that work. IFIs have become quite big in it. Uh, um, IFIs, of course, have World Bank, uh, regional banks. Uh, the IMF have all announced uh, quite a lot of programs and, and uh, very large numbers. Um, but how much of that can work its way to these environments? Uh, it remains, you know, question in my mind. And I wanted to get a little bit of your sense of that of how you see now the international community coming together. I mean, I know there's a UN two billion dollar program, a plan, and and uh, so that, of course, is largely, in the end, going to go through the UN agencies. You know, if I understand, 95% of it is sort of going through UN agencies. But you're also working with others on it. And uh, be good to get a sense of how you feel all that is coming together. And, and particularly from what you just said, you know, that the peak in these environments, maybe three months or six months down the road, are we getting organized as best as we can to help when when these countries are really going through the worst of the pandemic, which is still to come. So a few things to pick up from what you've said there, um, Masood. Firstly, um, I mean, I'm sure your analysis must be right, that it's, that it, that it's going to be much harder in the kind of places where my colleagues and I work to run the preferred strategy simply because they have fewer health workers, fewer health facilities, much less equipment, m much weaker access to supplies and so on. Um, and um, also for the other reason you give, which is that people's reserves, their ability to be resilient and the extent to which they have savings which in OECD countries people do have so that they can um, live off their savings or they can get social protection. That's much less true in the kind of places we're talking about. Now, there's a number of things that follow from that. The first is that we need adaptive strategies. Your colleagues at CGD did some of the early work on, on that, Amanda, Amanda Glassman and some of her colleagues. And as you say, there's quite a lot of that work around now. A lot of it is still a little bit speculative, um, but the situation we're in is that 
we're going to have to try multiple experiments and learn from them and work out what works where as time passes. Now, I chair something called the Interagency Standing Committee, which is the heads of all the big UN humanitarian agencies like UNICEF and our refugee agency, UNHCR, and all the others, plus the heads of the International Committee of the Red Cross and the, the, the head of the International Federation of National Red Cross Societies, plus some NGO umbrella groups. Um, and what we're doing in that group is later this week, we will be publishing basically a set of adaptive measures a couple of dozen things that we think in the kind of settings you're talking about may be important to try and learn from and see what works and um, uh, build up a better knowledge base for what you can do in low resource settings. And then the important thing will be to learn as we go along. Um, and I hope that the academic and think tank and scientific community will keep contributing to that because um, we're going to need it for, for a while. Um, the next thing relates to um, paying for a response. And um, there's a couple of things I'd like to say about this, really. Um, the first is that um, if my hypothesis that the potentially the biggest cause of suffering will be the economic downturn, then I think it's really important to work out what kind of response is appropriate to that? And, um, and and then at the same time to work out a response for the disease itself and the, the most extremely vulnerable people, those who are going to starve to death unless we do something. So I, I'll try and put something out a little bit more formally on this over the next um, several days or week or so. But, but my back of the envelope calculations are that for about $90 billion, which is a lot of money. On the other hand, it's, it's also 1% of the um, stimulus plan, the G20 and the rest of the OECD have put in place. For about $90 billion, you could do a couple of big and important things. Firstly, for the most vulnerable um, people in the low income countries, you could provide a 10% a stimulus to protect a lot of the people who are not yet um, in the humanitarian caseload and may not get the disease, but, but are about to become a lot more vulnerable. Now, you could, you could do that largely, in, I think, through the IFIs, because those people are mostly in places which have ongoing relationships with the IFIs. And as we know, the IFIs have more firepower now than they did in 2008. What what you have to do, though, because those countries also have a bigger debt problem uh, accumulating, you have to look at the terms. And I think what Kristalina has been doing on um, debt service pauses um, is a step in the right direction. But I think other things are needed. Personally, I think it's not too early to think about SDR allocation. I think thinking about the pricing on the uh, bank side is going to be important. You know, the last capital increase from the World Bank introduced this concept of differential pricing. I think we need to push that concept further. And there'll probably need to be other forms of subsidy as well to make it affordable for those countries to access resources on that kind of scale. And then the other element um, is, is an element I, it, it, of about $30 billion, which is needed to finance a substantial increase in humanitarian for those people who are simply totally destitute and will not survive, just won't survive, without external assistance, which their governments can't or won't provide. Plus the very basics of a health response to the disease itself. Now, again, $30 billion is a lot of money. On the other hand, it's only 20% of um, annual global official development assistance. And, and to pick up an earlier point you made, um, in a way, the world has a choice. It can deal with a problem for 10 years, 
or it could make a bigger one-off investment and contain the problem a bit better and find it's, e find it's easier to deal with it over the following decade. So, you know, for a combination of another 30 billion or so of ODA and 60 billion of IFI leveraged resources on more affordable terms, I think you could make a very substantial difference. Now, let me just say a word about one of the pieces of the jigsaw in that big picture I've just painted, which is the um, global humanitarian response plan that Antonio Guterres and Tedros and Henrietta Fora and I launched on 25 March. We asked for $2 billion as a first phase of gearing up a response in these countries with the big humanitarian settings. That was, that was um, four weeks ago. And in the, in the first four weeks, starting from nothing, we've raised a billion dollars. And I think that's an encouraging start. And that is being used to get more tests and kits and equipment and so on in, to scale up water and sanitation programs, to launch a huge training program for health workers. WHO is training 2 million health workers through its online programming. So to run a massive public information campaign and crucially a combating campaign for disinformation and to start to experiment and pilot with the combination of shielding, distancing, isolation. Because we're going to need a lot of new techniques to do that in congested places with high refugee populations. Now, that plan is um, a collective plan of the UN and the NGOs. A lot of the last mile delivery is by the NGOs. And an important element of that plan is a logistics capability that the World Food Programme is putting in place to uh, compensate for the disappearance of a lot of commercial airline um, logistics and um, other you know, cargo handling, and also to get aid workers in and out to tough places and to protect them better. So one of the things we're doing is setting up this network of field hospitals so that for our courageous frontline workers putting, their, putting themselves at risk, we've got something to say when they ask the important question, well, if I get sick, what's going to happen? So we're making good progress on all those things, but what we launched on 25 March was just a start. And we said to everyone, look, we'll be back on this. And our next update, which is going to have a bigger bill attached to it, will be on will be on the 7th of May. So off, off the, I mean, just to pick up a bit on, on the different elements then. Uh, let, let's let's go back to the the 10 percent stimulus that you're talking about, you know, the the 60 billion in a way. Um, what, Obviously, what you see so far is a willingness on the part of the IMF and the World Bank to, to step up. Uh, and you know, the IMF talks about having a trillion dollars of resources, and you, know, you can argue about whether the trillion is a trillion or if by the time you discount it for various things, it might be a bit less, but it's still in hundreds of billions. And the World Bank talks about a plan of 160 billion that they want to do in the next uh, 15 months, uh, of which uh, 60 billion, I think, is going to be IDA, and, and the other is going to be a sort of IBRD mostly, and a bit of IFC, and the regional banks are doing it. Um, a lot of this, however, is going to go to the middle income countries. Now, there may well be a case that even with this, actually, the middle income countries are being a bit forgotten because uh, on the other side, which is on the debt uh, standstill for official bilaterals that's been agreed by the G20 communique, and again, you can sort of, you know, have a discussion about how binding and just exactly how it'll get implemented, but that only covers the the poorest countries and the middle income countries don't really get much relief from that. And they're also the ones which have borne the brunt of the private sector withdrawal, the 100 billion plus of private money that's come out of emerging markets in developing countries and mostly come out of middle income ones. So they're there. But let's put their issue aside for a minute and come back to the poorer countries. So the ability of the international institutions to help the 
poorest countries is much more constrained by the amount of concessional money that they have, and even the concessional money may turn out to be quite expensive, and also by their concerns about debt sustainability, which sort of adding on any new kind of loans to them does. So, so it does raise a sort of challenge of how quickly these institutions can gear up their support. And uh, the other side of this is, you know, how effective the countries themselves are going to be in then taking the additional fiscal space that they get and translating it into the income support for the targeted poorer households they're in. And some of them have cash transfer programs, but but the more you get towards the communities where you are particularly focused, the less effective are the mechanisms for actually getting targeted income support from governments to households. And so, in a way, you know, to the extent in refugee communities where the registered refugees, UN systems, you know, are quite effective at sort of identifying and supporting people. But the people who are not quite there, who are sort of, you know, the, were working but now are out of a job, don't have the reserve, and most of them were working in the informal sector, 80% you know, of the workforce is in informal economy in many of these countries. Um, so you can't really go through the enterprises in the same way as you would in, in other countries. So I want to get a little bit of sense of how you see what you're hearing about ways in which that is working or might work better, you know, are, as you say, that we're going to be learning a lot from experiments as we go. And I'm still quite uh, unsure about how effectively the money, even when it's there, will actually do the last mile, as you say, uh, to get to the people. Do you have any, any thoughts or, or any feedback from your colleagues working in the field on that? Well, this, I think we'll come on, shall we, to the acute humanitarian settings where there are a different set of issues. Right. Um, but so what I'm about to say deals more with um, low income countries who um, are not dealing with a huge um, humanitarian problem and whose governments have a degree of capability, Bangladesh. Um, yeah. many African countries. Now, um, there's two sorts of challenges there. The first is availability of affordable money, which you touched on and, and, and I tried to talk about. My basic view about that personally is a useful start has been made, but a, a lot more needs to be done. Yes. And I think what's needed is a crisis mentality. I mean, there, there needs to be a crisis mentality brought to mind when we think about, for example, the debt sustainability issue. If you think about it, that's exactly what's happened in the world's biggest economies. Extraordinary measures have been taken. And um, really, there is a, a national interest in the same countries to, to make a little tiny investment in some of those similar kinds of measures in the kind of countries I'm talking about. Partly, of course, for the reason that um, no one is safe from this virus until everybody's safe from it. So there's a shared interest in tackling it everywhere. Now, um, in most of those places these days, there is a capacity to run social protection systems. Um, in some countries, there's really been huge progress made on that in the last decade or so. Bangladesh is one of the cases. No. Pakistan has a, as you know, much better than I do, has a really impressive um, income support program, the Benazir income support yeah. program, tried and tested through the floods and, and other crises and so on. And quite a large number of countries have that now, including some very, very um, vulnerable ones who are just coming back really into the international fold. So Somalia, when we staved off the famine in Somalia in 2017, the most important um thing that was done to that was to send mobile money through text messages to 600,000 households yes. which meant that um you know the problem we ran into in the 2011 famine in Somalia where al-shabab were kidnapping and looting um food convoys 
well, you can't kidnap a text message. And it turned out that markets, if people had the purchasing power, would work. So in a lot of countries, those social protection systems um, are more functional than they used to be. And mobile money helps with that. Now, we shouldn't understate the um, fiduciary challenges around all that. But again, um, they're, they're more navigable than people sometimes want to um, fear. And we're in, a, we're in an extraordinary moment, so we're going to have to accept some trade-offs. Yes. Um, now, let, shall I pause there, or do you want me to go on to the I, I just, I just more difficult to say, I think the, the, the core point you raise, uh, you know, which is, you know, there is a disconnect, contrast between the nature of the measures that we have taken within the rich countries where we've done things that would have been considered sort of impossible, you know, so the impossible becomes the inevitable quite quickly, you know, in a crisis. And yet, at the moment, in the international response, it's just slightly, if you look at the G20 communique, I mean, as you say, it's a bit of a nice start, but, but it, it's not reflective of a mindset that we are facing a once in a century pandemic and an economic crisis whose consequences will be comparable to the depression of the 1930s. So, you know, we, and I guess my question to you, you're sitting in the UN, you know, you're, you're right in the middle of the sort of trying to get a sense of political debate. Why is it that the, in, the intellectual argument that I think you just made that, you know, we're this virus will only be, this pandemic will only be defeated when it's defeated everywhere. And it's a global problem that can only be solved when it's solved everywhere. And that the costs of doing that at the margin are, you know, small in relation both to the long-term consequences and in relation to what we're spending at home. And yet, you know, when you talk about things like uh, SDR allocation, which would be sort of one way or or increasing odor for, for temporarily to deal with this or, or other ways of putting aside debt sustainability concerns for a couple of years while we sort of get on with the, providing the cash flow. We're still operating under the old rules. And, 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 and I guess the rules to my mind are not compatible with the sort of nature of the crisis we're facing. So, so I wanted to get a little bit of your sense of both why that is, but also what are promising ways in which one would uh, get over that that uh, political and public awareness? So I think it arises for a couple of reasons. I mean, firstly, let's be candid. It's a little bit of a commentary on the state of global geopolitics and, and relationships. The second issue, though, is that um, the countries which have had the biggest problem on the pandemic so far in Europe and North America, obviously most of their headspace and policymaking bandwidth has been on dealing with the immediate problem for their own citizens, as it should have been. I mean, that was right. But, but looking forward, I think policymakers will increasingly be confronted with the fact that um, to protect themselves, there needs to be a stronger response in other places. Um, and you do see some of the beginnings of that. On uh, Friday last week, there was the call to action on uh, the development of um, therapeutics and vaccines in a way which um, tries to maximize some kind of assurance to everybody that there'll be a, le a reasonably rational approach to making them available. Um, but I, but I, the, one of the reasons I'm pleased to be having this conversation with you now is because I think now is the moment to get these issues onto the agenda more squarely and more fully. Um, because um, as we get into the end of this year and next year, the fiscal reality in in the big economies is going to come home to roost a little bit, and the trade-offs will get. Um, acute again, and people are going to need to be far sighted 
in terms of their own interests, um, never mind, um, you know, coming at this from the perspective of generosity and empathy, just in terms of brutal, hard in self interest, it's going to be sensible to invest a little bit of your total effort in, um, in more difficult places. And that needs to include the places with the huge humanitarian challenge. I don't think people want to live in a world where we, we see the return of um, multiple famines taking millions of lives in lots of countries. I don't think that's what people want to see um, for human reasons, but also because of the deeper understanding there is now of the um, risk that that brings with it, um, threats to everybody, instability, um, terrorism, migration, all sorts of other challenges which uh, respect no borders. Yes, I mean, you, you've been arguing for a while, long before COVID. I mean, you've been arguing for the need to be more anticipatory in terms of thinking about sort of humanitarian system response. And, and I think if anything, you know, in a way, now is the moment for us to, you don't even have to anticipate too far forward. <laughs> to recognize that you need to act now. And in the actions, if you think about the global COVID curve and flattening the peak, and just think of it in terms of how you could flatten the peak most effectively globally, because recognizing that, you know, wherever it is, uh, it's gonna come and have consequences for everyone. The investment return ratio is going to be huge at the margin for investing in trying to uh, improve the outcomes in some of the the places where you were talking. So, so I think, you know, just from a recognition of the global nature of this just forces you to, to that conclusion. Uh, yeah. And I guess we have to do a better, you know, the people who are in the uh, community of development and, and uh, humanitarian uh, work just need to keep making the case in ways that are more, better communicated. You know, sometimes I do feel that perhaps, you know, people who work in our space are are, are better at communicating to others who work in the same space than we are to working with others who have very different backgrounds and perspectives. And, and maybe we just need to do that, a little better job of that. I don't know. Yeah, I think we definitely need to do that better. We, I think we also need to, um, for the policy community though, develop fuller um, propositional kind of offerings. Um, I've tried to paint a big picture on that today, but I think there's a lot more to be done to fill in some of the gaps there. Um, and um, we need to be, be able to find a way to engaging with the um, you know the, the real decision makers around the world, which is cognizant of the geopolitics, um, because having the best idea is fine, but unless you can find a way to get it adopted, it doesn't get you anywhere. So we need to build up that element in our thinking as well, and a lot of what. Um, Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, is doing at the, at the moment is trying to paint that big picture um, and, and trying to, um, you know, engage with heads of government on the right mix of measures. And this is going to be a continuing discussion, particularly while we fill in all the many missing gaps in our knowledge about the disease and what works in responding to it. Yes, absolutely. And I think in a way, this is also where the onus falls and a lot of people who are doing the, the research in this area, because at this stage, we are stronger at being able to look at the pros and cons of alternative approaches, but we're often not in a place where the evidence for either side is strong enough to come out with a strong policy recommendation. You know, So should you keep schools open or should you keep them closed? 
we can figure out that there are costs on both sides and articulate what those are, but it's much harder to come out and say this is the right thing to do because we just don't have enough uh, evidence yet uh, to, to do that. On the other hand, you know, for policymakers, what they need is to be able to make a decision today. <laughs> and and yeah. so that's the journey that has to go from, from gathering more evidence to, to help us to make stronger uh, propositions that, that you mentioned. And policymakers need to be helped to um, treat it as a virtue to consistently adopt John Maynard Keynes's dictum. When the facts change, I change my opinion. What do you do? Because the facts are going to change <laughs> and it will be a virtue to keep up with them. So just to add, Mark, can I, can I just ask you to, at this stage, there is a little bit of speculation in it, which is to think a bit beyond the next two years. And let's, let's think about the sort of life and, and development, cooperation, humanitarian system, and its functioning in the sort of post-COVID world. And I wanted to get a little, I know you and your colleagues in the UN have been doing some thinking about this issue also already in terms of, you know, how this is likely to change the way people think and interact and, and uh, uh, be good to get your sense of any at this stage early preliminary thoughts on on how you think this is likely to impact the way we think about development and we think about development cooperation. Well, that's a great question, and um, my answer is definitely in the category of ask me in six months and I'll have changed my mind. But to my last point, but um, here's a few things I think are going to happen. Firstly, I think in pretty much every country, there's going to be a significant increase in investment in public health, and that's a good thing. Secondly, I think there'll be a huge global uptick in effort on um, science and technology and products for dealing with um, major disease outbreaks and risks. Thirdly, I think there's going to be a serious um, rethinking through, uh, which will have consequences for many countries of um, what to do about some of the things we've seen on the supply chain over the last six months. I think lots of countries will want bigger stockpiles of essential things, and I also think that there will be some relocation of some manufacturing capabilities. Fourthly, I think um, there will be um, Huge acceleration of digitalization. I may never go back to my office. Um, fifthly, you say that with a sort of mixed feeling there. That I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, fifthly, um, you know, I do think that the macro consequences. Um, are going to be a big deal. I, I mean, I'm afraid that compared with what people were saying a month or two ago, it's clear that the downturn will be bigger and longer than previously hoped. And I think that has significant consequences potentially for, um, for international cooperation on global public goods. But sixthly, though, to end on a more positive point, I think that you know, this experience really is the ultimate case study for why countries need to collaborate in tackling global public bads. Yes. So yes. in a benign world, this one of the takeaways would be we better do something about climate change, etc. Absolutely. No, I think those are all really valuable uh, insights. And then particularly the last point, you know, in a way, if you needed a reminder, you know, the, the current pandemic has demonstrated just how interconnected our world is and why you need to have a coherent 
functioning approach to tackling global public bads. And and I, I would just sort of frame it one slight uh, the different footnote to, to that way you said that last point is that I think whether the world view is benign or not benign, whether you believe that everybody is going to cooperate in doing this uh, because they all sort of have the same views about how the world should operate or whether you believe that there's going to be great power rivalry and we're going to be, you know, closer to a world in which people are competing and, and maybe even antagonistic on a variety of fronts. You have to find a way of tackling global public bads. So I think you know that the operational consequences, whatever the political geopolitical context, you have to find a way of tackling global public bads. So I think for me that is sort of one big learning. And then and the other side of this is that you can't divorce the treatment of global public bads from efforts to strengthen national capabilities to address the same issue. So you can't do global health security without strengthening national health systems. And, and you know, that, that I think, is, you know, the, the, this can't be a sort of superimposed effort to create global health security without focusing on the choices and trade-offs and, and institutional structures that exist in individual countries. So, so I think that those are all going to be very important lessons for all of us going forward. Mark, we shall have another conversation, as you say, in, in a few months' time when we are both have a bit more evidence and, and uh, we can then reflect on what we think then might be the consequences. But thank you for the great work you and your colleagues are, are doing. We really do. I think sometimes people don't recognize uh, the personal uh, courage and, and dedication that comes from from the community of workers that is out there trying to see what they can do to help control this pandemic in some of the most difficult and sometimes some of the least safe places. Uh, and, and I think that whatever, whenever we have the chance to sort of recognize and salute them for it, uh, we should. So thank you for, for your leadership of it and uh, to you and your colleagues for the great work you're doing. Always a well, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Masood, for a very stimulating conversation.